In the last tutorial, we developed the Shell and Tube Heat Exchanger model. And in the results section, we did some very basic analysis where we saw temperature distribution on a plane at the center of the heat exchanger. We made a few comments on the fact that there weren't sufficient cells to extract heat from these tubes. And we also made a comment that this data isn't particularly useful. What we're going to do in this tutorial is determine the value of the overall heat transfer coefficient using expressions in ANSYS CFD post. So if we begin by looking at the definition of the overall heat transfer coefficient. So the overall heat transfer coefficient is given by this variable u. And in this case, q dot is the rate of heat transferred out. So that can also be written as mass flow rate times Cp times the change in temperature. A is just some area. In this case, it's going to be the area of the outside of the tubes. And there is also this LMTD term. And this is just log mean temperature difference. And it's an average temperature difference, but because heat transfer isn't linear, in these cases along the shell and tube, we need to account for that by taking a log mean. So what these subscripts mean are H means hot, so in this case it would be the hot fluid moving through the tubes, and C means cold, so that would be the fluid moving through the shell, and I and O just mean in and out. So these would be those values at the inlets and at the outlets. So we're going to follow this form and we're going to apply this in CFD post in the expressions and we should be able to calculate some value of U. So if we begin by selecting an expression, so I'm going to call this one Q dot, so this is just rate of heat transfer. And in this case, because we're conserving energy, heat transferred from the tubes is going to be transferred to the shell fluid. Because of this, we can calculate Q dot as being the mass flow rate of fluid through the tubes times Cp, so the specific heat capacity of water, and then multiply that by the difference between the average inflow temperature and the average outflow temperature in the tubes. So I'm going to begin by showing the tube inlets and the tube outlets and just hiding this plane. So Q dot is going to be given to us as mass flow rate. So if we right click Select Functions, CFD Post, we have Mass Flow. And at what boundaries? That's going to be at locations, tube, inlet. So we can just test that by saying that's one kilogram per second through all of those tubes. That's going to be multiplied by some value of Cp. So in this case I'm going to use the value of 4200 joules per kilogram per Kelvin. Just be careful here that you have capital J and capital K, because these are people's names, Joule and Kelvin. Now we need to multiply this by the average temperature at the inlet and at the outlet. So I'm going to open brackets. 
and I'm going to take area average. The thing we're interested in is temperature, and where we're interested in is outlet. So in this case, it's tube outlet. And that's going to be minus I can just take this and just put tube inlet we do know the value of the tube inlet because we specified it as being 99 degrees but just to save you having to put it in manually I've just written it in here so obviously if something changes, if you decide to change that inflow temperature, then obviously this equation will still hold. So where are we taking this average? We're taking that at location tube inlet. So what you see down here is that we have a heat exchange of 14.6 kilowatts. So now we have our value of Q dot. I'm going to create another one. I'm going to call it HT area because it's the heat transfer area. So the heat transfer in this case is going to be occurring across the outer surfaces of the tube, which in this case are going to be interfaces with the fluid domain that it's inside the shell. So what I'm going to do is take the area. So to make sure we select the correct area, we just go to outline and we see that the interface that happens with the shell is this one here. So it's default fluid solid interface side one one. So we can just right click and select location default fluid solid interface side 1 1 so it's that area there and then we just select apply and it gives us some value of about 0.23 meters squared and then we can create our final variable so in this case it's going to be lm td which is this log mean temperature difference I'm just going to pull up the equation so we know where to begin it's going to be the average hot out minus the average cold in. So hot out is going to be these surfaces here. So it's going to be tube fluid outlet. So again functions average temperature tube outlet, hot out, minus the same function area average temperature but for cold in, so in this case that's going to be shell in, so that's this term done minus average hot in minus call out so again just copying that function so it's going to be tube inlet and then on a shell out. So the numerator of our log mean temperature difference comes out like this. So I'm just going to put another set of brackets to separate the numerator from the denominator. So then we divide that through by, in this case, 
this denominator here. So we take a log function first of all, and it should just be written as log, but if you're not sure about that, just right click and go to CEL, and there is natural log here. So we have the first line that we need to deal with. So the average hot out minus the average cold in. So we know the average hot out is going to be this one, and the average cold in is going to be here. So we can just take this function at the top. So then we need to take hot in minus cold out. which of course is this one here. So just placing that in there. And just check for any errors. So common errors in this case would be an incorrect number of brackets and it's perfectly normal. It does happen quite easily because you can see the number of terms that exist there. Okay, so having finished putting in all the equations for the log mean temperature difference, I've got a value of 60.1905 Kelvin. If you do have any issues here, the main sources tend to be number of brackets and whether or not you've got a variable in the brackets and just making sure that the location is written absolutely correctly. So making sure that upper cases are upper cases and lower cases are lower cases. This is why I've started using the right click option and going down to location because that way the solver gives it you exactly how it's written and there's no risk of upper or lower case mistakes. So finally, I'm just going to right click and create a new. So our overall heat transfer coefficient u is going to be defined as q dot and that's divided by, in this case, HT area and the log mean temperature difference. So this should now come together and it should give us some coefficient that says watts per meter squared per Kelvin. In this case, we've got a negative value because I took it as a negative heat transfer, in this case from the tubes, but of course you can do it for the shell and that will give you positive heat transfer coefficient. And to some extent it doesn't actually matter what direction the heat transfer is acting, it's just the fact that it does occur. So I suppose a point to make here is that this is an idealised system in the sense that I've chosen the outer wall to be adiabatic. So that's not always going to be the case with a realistic heat exchanger. I'm also going to go back and refine the mesh. So add more prism layer cells and see what effect that has on this 1060. So if we just shut down CFD post and then open up meshing so I'm going to begin by just right-clicking, inserting, and creating some inflation layers. And the geometry I'm going to create them on is going to be the shell. So that's the domain we're interested in. And I'm just going to hide everything else. And going back to these inflation options, the boundaries I'm interested in here are this surface, this surface, this surface, this surface, this surface, and this surface. And I'm going to make them relatively small, so I'm going to have a lot of control over the thickness, and I'm going to make them about 3 millimeters. Hopefully this should alone significantly influence the heat transfer. 
I'm then going to repeat the process, but in this case, I'm only going to do it for the insides of the tubes. So I'm going to show all bodies, and I'm going to hide the shell and all of the metal walls. So if we hide those, and then I'm going to repeat the process to create another inflation layer, but this time just for the inside of the tubes. So if we go insert, inflation, and again these are our domains that we're interested in. And the boundaries we're interested in are these walls here. And again, I'm going to select the total thickness. I'm going to keep it slightly smaller. And one thing it's always worth doing when you go to mesh, just ensure that the quality is as low as 0.85 and that we smooth it. And what this should do is produce a better quality mesh, which should improve the quality of the simulations and the accuracy of the results. Okay, so just shutting down meshing, just update the mesh, so right click, select update, and then once you've done that, just double click solution, and I'm going to select a parallel problem, and I've got four processes on this computer, so I'm going to set that running, and then we'll have a look at the changing results once it's finished. So now that the simulation has been rerun with prism layer cells on the inner fluid but also in the shell domain, what we can see is that the overall heat transfer coefficient has increased by approximately 8%. Of course there are other improvements to make such as refining the size of the cells in the free stream areas. And of course, if you wanted to actually redesign the heat exchanger, you would also include baffles in different positions to cause the flow to mix a lot more. So I hope that was helpful. We've now generated some equations using expressions in CFD post to calculate the overall heat transfer coefficient of a heat exchanger.